Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this chat about inclusive education. These sessions are designed to bring to you uh, the perspectives of people working on, working with, engaged in inclusive education in Canada. And uh, I'm Gordon Porter, the Director of Inclusive Education Canada. I'm joined by my colleagues, Diane Richler, who's the chair of the Catalyst for Inclusive Education Initiative of Inclusion International. And Diane's a former executive vice president of what's now Inclusion Canada. And Jackie Speck, who's a professor of education at Western University in London, Ontario, and is the director of the Canadian Research Center on Inclusive Education. Our guest today is Tiffany Gallagher, who's a professor in the Department of uh, Education or Educational Studies in the Faculty of Education at Brock University. Tiffany has contributed a great deal to research and development of inclusive education in Ontario and in Canada. Uh, she's worked on literacy challenges of youngsters. Uh, she's been involved in uh, a learning lab at Brock University that connects to the community and provides assistance to youngsters in her community. And interestingly, Tiffany is a parent of a young woman with disabilities. Her name's Victoria. And uh, she's worked very hard to see that her daughter is included. And she has shared with me the uh, perspective that that's going very well. So. We'll want to hear about that, Tiffany, as we proceed. So welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So why don't we start by just a little sense of how you got involved in what we call inclusive education. How did that happen for you? Was it part of your professional world, your professional work, or part of your personal life uh, through your daughter? I would honestly say it was both. And um, I'm one of those classic educators that knew I always wanted to be a teacher, even when I was a child. And I used to play teacher. So I think we all have fond memories of either being that person or knowing someone who was that person. Um, I had many younger cousins, uh, many of whom had, you know, um, some learning needs. And I remember spending my summers teaching them and preparing lessons and crafts and all sorts of activities for them. And that just rolled into my high school years when I picked up um, tutoring work and enjoyed it very much. And I found a great need for um, math tutoring and for tutoring in essay writing skills. And I like to sort of joke a bit and that's actually how I met my husband. I was his tutor in grade nine and uh, we've been together for 39 years now. And um, he said he never got rid of his, his grade nine math tutor. Um, <laughs> and he's an engineer now. Not to say that I'm an awesome math tutor, but uh, <laughs> he worked very, very hard. <laughs> so it's, it's always been sort of in my blood to work with uh, learners who have needs. Um, clearly learners who have needs in, um, in reading and in writing, and in, in numeracy skills, um, but learners who also have needs in uh, attention and um, focus, and uh, I, I believe very firmly in self-efficacy and positive mindset and so on. So um, for as long as I can remember, Gordon, I feel like I've been in inclusion um, and it just continues. So it continued all through my, obviously my um, undergraduate years. I, I did a BA in child and youth studies, and then my, my BEd, um, and my graduate work focused um, on, again, working with students who had learning exceptionalities and assisting teachers to support them in the classroom. So did you work in public education or in K to 12 education before you arrived at the university? I did um, briefly work for two years in Thunder Bay School Board. Um, and that was in the early 1990s when teaching jobs were at a premium. And um, Thunder Bay just wasn't sort of 
for me. Um, so we moved back to Southern Ontario and I started working in private practice at that point. I did not get a job in a school board and I worked in private practice supplemental education, doing um, academic assessments and providing tutoring services. And I owned uh, Sylvan Learning Center franchises at the time in the 1990s in uh, the Mississauga and Oakville area while I started to pursue my, my graduate work. Um, and then got a taste of what it's like to be teaching at the post-secondary level. And I sort of never turned back after that point. So what has the been the major focus of your research as it relates to inclusion? Can you share a little of that with us? Yeah, it's, it's really on, um, it's really sort of twofold. It's the teaching and learning dynamic, of course. Um, the learning dynamic in terms of focusing on um, what are the ways that we can equip our learners to be successful in um, literacy and numeracy skills. Um, I have a particular focus on, on literacy, but most recently um, with digital technology to support their learning. Um, and I love to use that term, it's often referred to as leveling the playing field and using technology to um, sort of leverage the um, accommodations that we have as educators now, um, but also the teaching piece and supporting teachers because teachers um, believe that they can do it. Many of them just need a little bit more support or some ideas or, um, you know, uh, coaching to um, use the tools that they have and the ideas they have and maximize the time that they have to, um, to provide all their learners with the best environment in the classroom. So, so in a nutshell, I'm looking at the teaching and learning dynamic um, and believe strongly in helping teachers do what they can do in the classroom. So Tiffany, when you talk about those digital technologies, have you seen a, a change in either the way that students approach their learning or the way that teachers are perhaps using those in the classroom over the last few years? Yeah. And what might those be and, and how are they better? How much better? Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I'm just finishing up a five-year project on coaching. And that's been coaching of all sorts. Um, instructional coaching, inclusion coaching, literacy coaching, digital coaching. And wow, what a change um, in helping teachers um, or supporting teachers, because if I think back to when the project started in 2015, um, teachers were like this about technology. You know, even, you know, a smart board was a scary thing in my room and the coaches had to do a lot of selling, a lot of coaxing, a lot of, um, you know, baby steps. And my goodness, doesn't the pandemic totally turn that on its head? Now, obviously the smart board or whiteboards are not being used in this context for the past year, but the digital learning coaches that I've been working with have never had a more important role than they have had now. And they have spent countless hours, um, weekends, weekends, helping teachers use what they can, the tools that they can, to help learners learn in remote environments. Um, so I think the big shift is in mindset and it, sort of embracing the technology and bringing it down now to um, tools that parents, students, teachers can all use together because we're learning in these different environments now we're not sitting in a traditional classroom every day all day so these tools have become so much more accessible um, and I think we're over that scary hump now and the, the teachers are just like okay I'm excited to learn what else I can do with this tool or you know it's not engaging some of my learners what else can I do to support them yeah so it's an exciting time to track yeah. this, I'll tell you, wow. Yeah, and, and interesting too, because it seems that, you know, years ago, these uh, digital uh, technologies were really only for those students with disabilities. And now it sounds like with your work, you're, 
you know, we're seeing for teachers being able to use it with all of their students and understanding how that can support their learners of differing abilities in their class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're over that learning curve. You know, last spring, it was about teaching kids, you know, how to use the mouse or the trackpad on their Chromebook. Um, and as we know, you know, that's not intuitive to all kids. Most kids are swipers, right? Um, and that's just physically, you know, something that is, I think, a little bit easier to do than that coordination required with a mouse or a trackpad. So um, that's just one example of what teachers have had to explicitly teach. Um, and coaches have had to tell teachers, you need to do this, or you need to teach your kids how to turn off, you know, their mic or mute it, right? Um, how to keyboard. Teachers now have said to me last spring, they said, I wish I would have spent more time on basic keyboarding skills with my kids, in particular primary level kids. So we're really, uh, we've really come a long way in a short period of time. I'm, I'm optimistic that these skills are going to be transferable. Um, so the classroom two years from now is going to look entirely different. And I, I really believe leveling the playing field is is a positive thing now because all kids will be using these these tools, right? It won't be reserved to certain learners. So this will enhance inclusion, you think? I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic for two reasons. Teachers are just more, more aware now, more able to um, teach with these methods. Students have now some of these basic skills. And I think they see it as this is how we all learn now. It's again, not just those kids who need this device or need that application or need this. This is how we all need to do it. So I, I, I'm optimistic. I'm, I'm being really positive about that. So getting this into teacher training might be a priority now. Oh, aren't we in teacher ed scrambling to do this this past year? Wow. Good. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad I don't teach the tech ed course, but. I've been trying to model it as best I can in my courses. I, I teach cognition and the exceptional learner, and then I teach um, a course on uh, reading, reading difficulties and assessment. And I mean, those courses look profoundly different than they did a year ago. Um, I have so many questions for you, Tiffany. I don't see how I'm possibly going to fit them all into the time that we have. Um, so I want to pursue this line of thinking first, and then I want to take a completely different tack. But um, as someone who doesn't know a lot about um, using technology for inclusion in this way, I'm just wondering how that relates to other um, practices that foster inclusion. Um, I'm thinking about you know, peer um, uh, cooperative learning and, and grouping students. Is, is that all something that's built into the technology or like when I use a computer, I use it on my own. And, you know, it's a very personal individual exercise. How, how are you able to link um, a focus on technology with some of the other important elements that promote inclusion. Mm -hmm. So that's a really interesting uh, thought there, Diane. And I, I think to uh, one group of teachers I worked with in Hamilton, um, about, I think about 15, 16 of them, who were really embracing blogging. And um, they embraced blogging because their children could collaborate, their students could collaborate, um, add to a blog, add to each other's comments and so on. So they saw like this little digital community being built, but the blogging was fantastic because they were using kid blog as a platform. And the students who could not express in writing could upload videos and voice notes and, and different types and different modalities to express their ideas to their peers. So I found that fascinating because I thought not only is it remote, it's building community and collaboration, but again, it's giving everyone the means that is most suitable to express or communicate their, their learning. And 
you know, they were getting quite uh, critical of each other, critical in a good sense. Like, you know, your post or, or your comment about, again, it's something they were doing in the class. You could have added more detail there. And, and this was a voice note by a student who, you know, was not able to, to, to write that. So I like, wow, you know, um, and, and kids feeling safe about that. And it's all, it's all stemming back to the teacher, making them feel like that kind of contribution is in a safe place. Safe place. That's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Can I, can I pivot for a second? Mm -hmm. um, because I was really interested that to hear that your personal commitment to learners who might be having some challenges um, preceded by many years your experience as a parent. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering um, if you could talk a little bit about what you learned as a parent supporting a child, your daughter, to go through the system, what what things were different from a parent perspective than they had been from a professional perspective? Yeah, that I mean, for for many of us parents um, with students with with a need, um, it, it's a little bit of uh, you know, it's an ironic role, really. Um, I, I recognized her needs when she was three. And um, I felt kind of like I was born to be this mom. I was born to be this mom, knowing I would be an advocate from this point forward and you know, starting with those assessments and appointments and, and so on. Um, so I felt really, um, I felt really kind of blessed. I felt equipped. Not to say it's been easy. I think every parent will tell you that. You know, um, you never know sort of what challenges lie ahead. And I think early on, um, making her aware of, of her challenges and how she needs to self-advocate is really important. I, I recall a conversation after her first psychoeditic assessment when she was eight and putting it into terms that she could understand as to what she's going to have to keep reminding teachers about. Um, and just sort of saying that that's your role now as a, as a big, big girl, right? Um, so give us some examples, like give, give us some specifics around that. Yeah. Well, when she was, um, in elementary school, um, you know, this is before the days of Chromebooks and, and so on. And, you know, she would have to go to the back of the class to a, a static desktop computer and go on a particular, um, you know, software program to do her writing and, and her reading. Um, and she said that she hated putting on the big headphones, everyone was staring at her, that sort of isolation. And so, you know, her expressing that to me and then me now, I understand what the teacher was doing this, the teacher was providing those accommodations that needed to be there, but a light bulb went off and I'm like, it's a social thing now, it's an acceptance thing. As a pre-adolescent, she's feeling um, that she's different. Um, and so having to work with the school to come up with some solutions about how she can use that software out of school time. So she wants to sit at her desk and she wants to do what everybody else is doing and then she'll work with the software at home. So they had to give me a license to use it at home and, and go through some of those, you know, those details. But that was the solution for her. And I'm, I'm like, of course, I mean, I, I teach that, but it, it didn't click until, you know, my 11 year old was saying, I'm not doing this at the back of the room. You know, I don't, I don't want to look weird going back there. Um, you know, she, she's been very, very independent and um, wonderful at, at being a self advocate with the exception of social isolation or social that social awareness so it came up again in high school and not wanting to go to the resource room so that was done again after school times and, and so on um was it hard to convince the the schools to make those adaptations and um, would a parent who didn't have your um credentials be able to do it 
they were certainly aware of you know where I worked, so to speak, <laughs> and what I did. Um, so I've often felt a little bit of guilt around that because I know there are parents who are not as um, uh, they don't have as much voice, right? Um, it didn't take much to convince them. Um, again, some of them felt like, aha, really? And I thought, okay, well, maybe you're not even seeing it because the quiet ones, the compliant ones don't always express these sort of, you know, anxieties around social acceptance. Tiffany, how, how do you think we can improve or strengthen the conception of parents generally? that inclusion is worth struggling for, that it's worth advocating and going to meetings and mm -hmm. having the conversations that are not always easy, that are necessary to make sure that our schools become more inclusive. How can we do that? I, and I guess I'm presuming that you know parents in your community who just kind of feel they have to go along with the first thing offered and it's not always inclusion. Yeah, I think it's becoming more and more challenging now because of the inequities around access. Um, so that I'm running a parent project right now and um, doing a series of workshops on helping parents with um, media literacy and digital tools learning in the home. And um, if I go back to the beginning of this project in the fall, what struck me the most was the lack, you know, the lack of parent awareness around what is out there. So I think that's where it needs to begin. Um, and I, I mean, that sounds like, you know, it's decades old, but now the issue is, you know, 10 years ago, there was these many resources and now there are these many resources and parents are confused. So part of the project has been you know, isolating it or almost coming up with Cole's notes of where you go, which website to go to, which, uh, you know, uh, groups to join, which apps to download, sort of vetting it for them because they're overwhelmed. And their kids are way ahead of them in terms of being able to access information. And it's not always, as we know, credible and appropriate. So, um, not just awareness, but awareness of what, what is most, um, I guess, effective, appropriate for parents is a place to start with inclusion. So another question, what do you think we need to do more research on to make schools in Canada, and let's be particular to your province, more inclusive systemically? What would we have to research and share with people that run our public education system to really move the bar higher on how, in, how they practice inclusion? Can you, can you see anything on the horizon that might be done to do that? That's huge. <laughs> Gordon, that's a huge- no, I'm not asking you to do very much. I mean, I'm being very- <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, I find it kind of poignant what we're talking today um, on the day that our, our kids in Ontario are returning after their spring break. <laughs> right. Um, and most of them are returning to learn online, right? Remotely, but our, our students who are in segregated special education settings are going to school. <laughs> so I think that's the place to start. Um, you know, so, the last last week it was announced that those students with special education needs will can have continued in-person support as they require additional support that can't be accommodated through remote learning well why can't it be accommodated through remote learning is my question so i, I think in this province we still have this um at least at the ministry level um and clearly school boards who are still offering segregated settings still have the other you know, mindset. These kids are othered and the rules are different for them. Um, parents, of course, have the option to not send their child. Special education teachers were supposed to be vaccinated. Um, 
but teachers unions are not happy with, you know, them returning. And I just think, you know, these kids this week or even this morning, walking in or being rolled into a school that's absolutely empty. None of their peers are there. They won't be there at lunch. They won't be there at recess. You know, how do those kids feel? Um, right? Like it's not how- just about it's not just about the methodology, but it's about the very fact that they see this as not being a problem. Right. And but the kids in their hearts, I know this morning when they went into those empty schools, they know there's a problem. Like they know this is this is not right. Right. right? Um, you know, even if they were in segregated classrooms, they were at least in school with other kids. Right. And perhaps having some opportunity to connect with them, maybe a period a day, or you know, as I said, at recess or on lunch or something. But that that's gone now. And I think it's gone to the end of the year. Let's be real, right? This is not going to change, I don't think, overnight. And we're going to be in June before you know it. So, um, but it really stems from, as I said, that other other mindset going way, way up the top. So it's interesting to hear, like, we started this conversation with um, these digital technologies are so useful for all kids and 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 so the pandemic has really pushed that forward and made that more inclusive. Yet on the other hand, it seems like for our children who are in those segregated settings, the pandemic has probably pushed inclusion further away for them. It's kind right. of a paradox in that way. You're right, right. But and- just reflecting on, you know, most of my work is, is international outside of Canada. And there's a huge um, emphasis on taking advantage of the pandemic to, as the expression goes, build back better. Mm -hmm. So that systems should not be going back to all the old problems that they had, but that they should take advantage of the fact that everything's been thrown up in the air Mm -hmm. to consider new ways of doing things. Mm-hmm. Do you see opportunities for highlighting some of the lessons? I mean, even just your your description of how students who are segregated might be able to articulate how they're feeling right now and be able to share that so that others can see the damage that's done to, you know, the self-esteem of all of these kids, to the expectations that their families have for them. Is, is there a way that we can, you know, sort of grab this moment to put a focus on how, uh, how excluded kids are because of their disability? Wouldn't we love to, Diane? Um, the reality is that as me, as most researchers were told back in the fall that school boards wouldn't be allowing us in to do any research. Um, and I have two grad students who are, you know, dedicated, they, they wanted to dedicate their research this year to that very kind of question. One student was working, um, one graduate student was working with students with autism and the other was working actually, um, you know, in, in the Peel region and she was looking at inclusion um, of individuals with, with students with, with disabilities, but also the cultural and linguistic um, needs as well. And even at our, our university won't allow them to do the work. Um, Why? So because, Why? Because of, of COVID, because, because of they're, they're afraid of the exposure and the risks. So I actually had this as one of my talking points today about there's going to be this this dearth of documentation right now this year because I don't really know of anyone doing anything active in in research in schools or in school boards. So I mean, hopefully we're going to be capturing this post hoc, but I worry that you know some of the salience of it is going to get lost. But if you can teach remotely, can't you research remotely? I agree. I agree. I agree. So, so we're, we're facing really fairly unique problems right at the moment as we record this chat. Yeah. 
but uh, can you reflect just in a final thought because our 30 minutes, as I told you, it goes very fast and uh, it has. So can you reflect where you think things will be in a few years? Like will schools in your community be more systemically inclusive? Will parents find it easier to advocate for inclusion? Where do you see things going? Hmm. Just in a, in a final comment. Well, I think I'll start with parents because I think um, I think parents appreciate teachers more um, and the, the work that teachers do. Um, I think parents are more skilled now than they've ever been at supporting their own their own learners. Um, I would love to believe what Diane has expressed that you know this is an opportunity for things to get shaken up and then rebuilt in a new way. But we know human nature is such that you tend to kind of go back to some of your old ways or your, you know, it, it's a human thing to, to resort to past practices. But I think um, that may happen, but there will be some shift for sure. I don't know um, to what extent, but I'm hopeful that, you know, technologies and having opportunities to learn in different ways will be the way that um, inclusive practices might be leveraged. Teachers are going to need to continue to have support because it's going to look different, you know, in a full day classroom, five days a week, as opposed to now where it's kind of like piecemeal, right? Sometimes we're online, sometimes we're not. But when it's full time, um, teachers will still need some assistance as to how that's going to look and, and what can they use. Well, I'm confident that you and your work at Brock, your research and your teaching, you're going to contribute to that. And uh, we, we are grateful for you participating with us today. And I remind people that Tiffany is one of our associates, part of what we call our network of associates. Uh, as part of Inclusive Education Canada, and you'll find her page on our website uh, and uh, some of the research and some of the articles and things that she's worked on over the years. And we try to update those regularly. So people can look there uh, to find out more about your work. And I want to thank you very much for chatting with us today. Thank you, Tiffany. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.